Now, I am going to tell you about the real nature of the Supreme Self, by realizing which one attains liberation and is freed from bondage. That realization of I is indeed the self which is experienced as I, I, shining of its own accord, the absolute being, the witness of the three states of waking, dream and deep sleep, distinct from the five sheaths, aware of the mental modes in the waking and dream states and of their absence in the state of deep sleep. That self sees all of its own accord but is never seen by any of these. It gives light to the intellect and ego, but is not enlightened by them. It pervades the universe, and by its light, all this insentient universe is illumined. But the universe does not pervade it even to the slightest extent. In its presence, the body, senses, mind and intellect enter upon their functions as if commanded by it. By that unbroken knowledge, all things from the ego to the body, objects and our experience of them occur and are perceived. By it, life and the various organs are set in motion. That inner self, as the primeval spirit, eternal, ever effulgent, full and infinite bliss, single, indivisible, whole and living, shines in everyone as the witnessing awareness. That self in its splendor, shining in the cavity of the heart as a subtle, pervasive yet unmanifest ether, illumines this universe like the sun. It is aware of the modifications of the mind and ego, of the actions of the body, sense organs and life breath. It takes their form 
as fire does that of a heated ball of iron. Yet it undergoes no change in doing so. This self is neither born nor dies. It neither grows nor decays, nor does it suffer any change. When a pot is broken, the space inside it is not. And similarly, when the body dies, the self in it remains eternal. It is distinct from the causal maya and its effects. It is pure knowledge. It illumines being and non-being alike and is without attributes. It is the witness of the intellect in the waking, dream and deep sleep states. It shines as I, I, as ever-present, direct experience. Know that Supreme Self by means of a one-pointed mind and know this I is Brahman. Thus, through the intellect, you may know the self in yourself, by yourself, and by this means, cross the ocean of birth and death and become one who has achieved their life purpose and ever remain as a self. Mistaking the body or not I for the self or I is the cause of all misery, of all bondage. 
This bondage comes through ignorance of the cause of birth and death. For it is through ignorance the people regard these insentient bodies as real, mistaking them for the self and sustaining them with sense objects and finally getting destroyed by them. Just as a silkworm protects itself by the threads that it emits but is finally destroyed by them. For those who mistake the rope for a serpent, the integral pure effulgence of the pristine state is veiled. Just as the dragon's head covers the sun in an eclipse, and as a result, the spirit forgets its reality. It is devoured by the dragon of delusion and mistaking the non-self for the self is overpowered by mental states and submerged in the fathomless ocean of samsara. Full of the poison of sense enjoyments and now sinking, now rising, they find no way of escape. Such are the torments caused by the projecting power of desire, together with the veiling of delusion. Just as the layers of clouds caused by the rays of the sun increase until they hide the sun itself, so the bondage of ego caused by ignorance in the self expands until it hides that very self. Just as frost and cold winds torment one on a wintry day when the sun is hidden by clouds. So too, when delusion covers the self, the projecting power of desire deludes the ignorant into mistaking the non-self for the self and torments them with many sorrows. So it is by these two powers alone that the self has been brought into bondage. Of this tree of samsara, Delusion is a seed. The I am the body idea is the shoot. Desire is the young leaf. Activity, the water that makes it grow. The body, the trunk. A person's successive lives, the branches. The sense organs, the twigs. Sense objects, the flowers. And diverse sorrows caused by activity, the fruit. The ego is the bird sitting in the tree and enjoying its fruit.
this bondage of the non-self, born of ignorance, causing endless sorrow through birth, death and old age, is without beginning, yet its complete destruction can be brought about in the way that I will tell you. Have faith in the Vedas and perform all the actions prescribed by them without seeking for any gain from doing so. This will give you purity of mind. With this pure mind, meditate incessantly and by doing so, you will directly know the self. This self-knowledge is the keen sword that cuts asunder the bonds. No other weapon or contrivance is capable of destroying them. Nor wind, nor fire, nor countless actions. The self is covered over by the five sheaths caused by the power of ignorance. It is hidden from sight like the water of a pond covered with weeds. When the weeds are removed, the water is revealed and can be used by a person to quench their thirst and cool them from the heat. In the same way, by process of elimination, you should, with keen intellect, discard the objective five sheaths from the self as not this, not this. Know the self distinct from the body and from all forms, like a stalk of grass in its sheaths of leaf. Know it as eternal, pure, single in its essence, unattached, with no duties to perform, ever blissful and self-effulgent. One who is liberated realizes that all objective reality, which is superimposed on the self as the idea of a serpent is on a rope, is really no other than the self, and they themselves are the self. Therefore, the wise aspirant should undertake discrimination between the self and the non-self. Of the five sheaths, food, life breath, mind, intellect and bliss, the gross body is created out of food. 
increasing by eating it and perishing when there is none. It is the sheath of food. Compounded of skin, blood, flesh, fat, marrow, excreta and urine, it is most filthy. It has no existence before birth or after death, but appears between them. It undergoes change every moment. There is no set law governing that change. It is an object like a pot, is insentient and has a variety of forms. It is acted upon by other forces. The self, on the other hand, is distinct from this body and is single, eternal and pure. It is indestructible, though the body with its limbs is destroyed. The self is the witness who knows the characteristics of the body, its modes of activity and its three states. It is self-aware and directs the body. Such being the contrast between the body and the self, how can the body be the self? The fool thinks of it as a self. The person of wise action with some measure of discrimination, takes body and soul together for I. But the really wise person who conducts the inquiry with firm discrimination knows themselves always as the Supreme Brahman, the being which is of its own nature. The I am the body idea is the seed of all sorrow. Therefore, just as you do not identify yourself with your shadow body, image body, dream body, or the body that you have in your imagination, cease also to associate the self in any way with the body of skin, flesh and bones. Make every effort to root out this error and holding fast to the knowledge of reality as the absolute Brahman. Destroy the mind and obtain supreme peace. Then you will have no more births.
even a learned scholar who perfectly understands the meaning of Vedanta has no hope of liberation if, owing to delusion, they cannot give up the idea of the non-existent body as the self. Now we come to the vital body of prana, which is the life breath with the five organs of action. The aforementioned sheath of food enters upon its course of activity when filled by this vital force. It is nothing but a modification of air and like air, it enters into the body and comes out of it. It does not know its own desires and antipathies or those of others. It is eternally dependent on the self Therefore, the vital body cannot be the self. The mental sheath is the mind with its organs of knowledge. This is the cause of the wrong concept of the self as I and mine. It is very powerful, being endowed with diversity of thought forms, beginning with the I thought. It fills and pervades the vital sheath, the ever blazing fire of the mental sheath is consuming this whole world lit by the five sense organs as sacrificial priests, fed by sense objects as the fuel, and kept ablaze by the latent tendencies. There is no ignorance apart from the mind. It is the cause of the bondage of birth and death. With the emergence of the mind, everything arises and with its subsistence, everything ceases. In the dream state, in which there are no objects, the mind creates its dream world of enjoyers and others by its own powers. Likewise, all that it perceives in the waking state is its own display. It is the experience of all that nothing appears when the mind subsides in deep sleep. Therefore, the bondage of samsara is only superimposed on the self by the mind. Actually, it has no reality. Just as the wind 
gathers the clouds in the sky and then disperses them. So the mind causes the bondage, but also causes liberation. The mind first creates in one an attachment to the body and to all sense objects, with the result that they are bound by their attachment like a beast tethered by a rope. Under the influence of desire and delusion, it is enfeebled and entangles persons in desire for the body and objects. But under the influence of sattva, purity, it breaks away from delusion and desire and attains to non-attachment and discrimination and rejects sense objects as though they were poison. Therefore, the wise seeker after liberation must first establish themselves in discrimination and desirelessness. The mind is a great tiger roaming wild in the huge jungle of sense objects. Therefore, aspirants should keep away from it. It is only the mind that conjures up before the self subtle and gross objects and all the variations of body cast and station in life, qualities and action, causes and effects. So doing, it tempts and deludes the self, which is really unattached pure intelligence binding it by the qualities of body, senses and life and deluding it with the idea of I and mine in the fruits of action that it creates. By means of this false representation the mind creates the myth of samsara for the spirit. This is the primal cause of the sorrow of birth and death, which binds those who are subject to the faults of desire and delusion and lack discrimination. Just as cloud masses revolve through the air, so does the whole world revolve through the delusion of the mind.
therefore, those who know reality declare that the mind is ignorance. One who seeks liberation must examine their mind by their own efforts and once the mind is purified by such introspection liberation is obtained and appears obvious and natural out of desire for liberation you should root out all other desires, renounce activity and take to perpetual preoccupation with truth, which will lead on to perpetual meditation. Then alone can the waves of the mind be stilled. Therefore, even this mind sheath cannot be the real self, since it has a beginning and an end, and is subject to modifications and characterised by pain and grief, and is an object of perception. The intellect, with the five organs of knowledge, is the Vijnana Maya sheath and is also the cause of bondage for the spirit. It is a modification of the unmanifest, beginningless self, which has assumed the form of the ego and conducts all activities through the reflective light of consciousness. It is the conscious agent of activity and its attributes are intelligence and actions. It regards the body and senses as I and their mode of life, duties, actions and qualities as mine. It performs good or evil actions as dictated by its previous tendencies and as a result of these actions attains to higher or lower regions and wanders there until it is attracted to rebirth in some enticing womb. It experiences the states of waking, dream and deep sleep and the pleasant and painful fruits of its actions. Within this sheath of knowledge, the self throbs as the self-effulgent light, the supreme soul, homogenous, the truth, all-pervasive, complete, immutable, the supreme lord, Yet the self assumes limitations through the false superimposition of the intellect on it in the sheath, because this is close to it, and in fact the closest 
of its adjuncts. As a result, it is deluded into thinking that it is this sheath. Just as a pot might seem to be different from its clay, so it imagines itself to be different from itself, to be the agent and the enjoyer, and seems to be limited in such ways. Although it is like the fire in a ball of hot iron, unaffected by the shape of the ball. In answer to the Guru, the disciple says, Master, I accept your statement that whether through delusion or not, the Supreme Self has come to regard itself as the ego. But since this superimposition of the ego concept is beginningless, it cannot be supposed to have an end either. How then can there be liberation? But if there is no liberation, the ego concept becomes eternal and bondage also becomes eternal. Pray, enlighten me on this point. To this the Master replies, That is a good question, my learned disciple. Now listen with one pointed mind to my explanation. Whatever has been conjured up by delusion must be examined in the pure light of reason. Things appear real as long as the delusion lasts and perish as unreal and non-existent as soon as it passes. Just like the illusion of a serpent seen in a piece of rope and appearing real as long as the illusion lasts. Really, the self is unattached, actionless, characterless, immutable, formless, being, consciousness, bliss. 
the inner witness. It has no sort of relationship with anything. To think that it has is a mere delusion, like the appearance of blue in the sky. The false attitude of the ego to the self is due to the relationship with the beginningless false vehicle. But even this sense of relationship is the result of delusion. Although this attitude of the ego to the self is without a beginning, that does not make it real. Just as water becomes clear as soon as the dirt is removed from it, so is it with the self when the effects of the ego and its false adjuncts are dropped from it and ignorance disappears through discrimination between self and non-self. Then appears the true self-effulgent knowledge of the oneness of God and self. The discarding of the beginningless ignorance with its cause and effects and bodies and states is like the ending of the beginningless non-existence or the ending of a dream when the waking state supervenes. Liberation from the bondage of the false ego concept can never come about except through knowledge acquired by discrimination between the self and the non-self. Therefore, you must also discriminate in order to remove the non-existent ego Even this intellectual sheath is subject to change, insentient, a part of a whole, and an object of perception. And therefore, it cannot be the Atman. Can the non-eternal ever become eternal? Coming now to the sheath of bliss. This is only a modification of ignorance on which the Supreme Self is reflected. It reveals itself at will in all three states, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep and yields the different modes of bliss from perceiving, obtaining, and experiencing things. It is experienced effortlessly by all, to some extent, in deep sleep. But sadhus who have practiced discrimination experience the bliss of it perpetually without effort and its fullness in the deep sleep state. However, even this sheath of bliss cannot be the Supreme Self since it is subject to change, 
and possesses attributes. It is the effect of past good deeds and a modification of Prakriti and it abides in the other sheaths which are themselves also modifications. If, by the rejection of false ideas, all five sheaths are eliminated, the self alone is experienced as I, I. It alone remains whole and self-aware, distinct from the five sheaths. The witness of the three states, self-effulgent, immutable, untainted, everlasting bliss. It is like Devadatta, who neither is the pot, nor partakes of its nature, but is only the witness. The self is not the five sheaths, which are objects, nor does it partake of their nature, but is a mere witness of them. To this, the disciple replies, O Master, after rejecting the five sheaths as unreal, I find nothing remaining except the void. So what is there to be known as I, I, as the truth of the self. The Guru replies, O learned one, you are skillful in discrimination and have spoken the truth. The rule of inquiry or perception is that which is perceived by something else has the latter for its witness. When there is no agent of perception, there can be no question of the thing having been perceived at all. Accordingly, the self, as awareness, cognizes not only itself, but also the existence of the ego with its various modifications of the transient names and forms and their nescience. Therefore, it is the self which is their witness. Beyond it, there is nothing to know. 
it is aware of itself through its own effulgence. And so is its own witness. It is single and immutable in the waking, dream and deep sleep states. It makes itself known as being consciousness bliss and is self-effulgent in the heart as I, I. Through your keen intellect, know this eternal blissful awareness to be the self or I. The fool takes the reflection of the sun in the water of a pot to be the sun. The wise person eliminates pot, water and reflection and knows the sun in the sky as it really is. Single and unaffected but illuminating all three. In the same way, the fool, through error and misperception, identifies himself with the ego and its reflected light experienced through the medium of the intellect. The wise and discriminating person eliminates body, intellect, and reflected light of consciousness and probes deeply into their real self which illuminates all three while remaining uniform in the ether of the heart. Therefore they realize the eternal witness which is absolute knowledge illuminating all. It is subtle and all pervasive neither being nor non-being with neither inside nor outside and is self-effulgent. Realizing this, one is set free from the impurities of the ego. They have no more birth or death. They are free from sorrow and become the immutable essence of established bliss. The jnani, who through experience has realized their self to be the Brahman as it really is, as truth, knowledge, endless bliss, the single essence, eternal, boundless, pure, unattached and indivisible, not only does not return to bondage, but is that Brahman itself, the Advaita. That is to say, that knowledge of the identity of Brahman and self is the prime cause of release from bondage.
for one who aspires after liberation. There is no other way of release from bondage, but knowledge of the identity of Brahman and self. Therefore, you too, by your own experience, know yourself as always, I am Brahman, and Brahman am I, Brahman alone am I. Since there is nothing other than Brahman, it is the Supreme Advaita. The pot, which is made of clay, has no other form than that of the clay. No one can show the pot except by means of the clay. The pot is only a delusion of the imagination and exists only in name, since it has no other reality than that of the clay. Similarly, the whole universe is a superimposition of form on the Brahman, although it seems to be separate from it. The substratum of Brahman appears through the delusion of the superimposition. The latter is really non-existent, like the serpent seen in the rope. The manifest is only an illusion. The silver seen in the substratum of the Mother of Pearl has no existence apart from it, but is the Mother of Pearl itself. Similarly, manifestation has no existence apart from its substratum of Brahman. Whatever, O oh Sadhu, appears to the deluded as the manifested world of names and forms on account of their ignorance and wrong knowledge, whatever objectivity appears as real, all this, when truly realized as it is, is the effect of Brahman and is superimposed on the substratum of Brahman. Only owing to delusion, it appears to be real. Really, all these names and forms are nothing at all. They are a myth, pure and simple, and have no existence apart from their substratum of Brahman. They are nothing but the being, consciousness bliss, which neither rises nor sets. If it were contended that the manifested world has any existence apart from Brahman. That would impair the infinity of Brahman. It would also contradict the authority of the Vedas, which declares in unequivocal terms, all this world is indeed 
Brahman. It would also make out the omniscient Lord as having uttered a falsehood when he said, all these elements are not in me. I, the indivisible whole, am not in them. The Mahatmas, who are true sadhus, would not countenance these contradictions. Furthermore, the outer world does not exist in a state of deep sleep, and if investigated, it is seen to be unreal, like the dream world. Therefore, any such statement made by fools as that the manifested world has its own existence apart from its substratum of Brahman is as false as the idle words of a man talking in his sleep. It is Brahman itself which shines everywhere, uniform and complete. This truth the enlightened jnanis know as the one without a second, formless, inactive, unmanifest, never to be destroyed, having no beginning or end. It is truth, absolute purity, the essence of pure bliss. It contains none of the internal differences which are the creation of Maya. It is eternal, continuous, immaculately pure, spotless, nameless, undifferentiated, self-effulgent, beyond the triads of Noah, knowledge, known, absolute, pure, unbroken consciousness, ever shining.